Hi, this is Randall Schwartz, host of Floss Weekly. This week, Jonathan Bennett joins me. We're going to be talking about Vadin, a great way to use Java to build your entire web stack. You're not going to want to miss this, so stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly with Randall Schwartz and Jonathan Bennett. Episode 499, recorded September 26, 2018. Baden. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications. Over 150,000 businesses rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash floss. It's time for Floss Weekly, the show about free, libre, open source software. I am your host, Randall Schwartz, Merlin at StoneEdge.com, bringing you each week the movers, the shakers, the big projects, the little projects, projects you may be using every day and totally unaware of it. This might be one of those. Projects you might want to download right after this show and play with. This might also be one of those. Once again, joining me is my lovely and talented co-host, Jonathan Bennett. Jonathan, welcome back. Hey, Randall. Uh, after quite a long dearth of not being here, I get to be, uh, what is this, two in a row or two in three weeks, something like that. It's wonderful to be back with you. Yes, yes. And you're always, a, 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 you're one of my favorite co hosts. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> Actually, folks, I'm just the one that says, yes, I can be available all the time because I work for myself. I set my own schedule. So don't let him lie to you. I'm like the last resort when everybody else is busy. It's like, okay, I guess we'll use Jonathan. <laughs> well, no, no. It's not like we're like, oh, who's going to be able to be here this week? It's not like that. Uh, for those of you uh, looking at the video, I, I am once again in my uh, bedroom, in my home. Uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon, or Beaverton, Oregon, actually, to be technical. Uh, I'll only be here for like another couple of days, and then I'm off on the road for another four weeks again. So you'll be seeing a lot of variety in my backgrounds over that period of time. Well, let's uh, let's get on with the actual show that's coming up here. So today we are welcoming back Vaden. We had the Vaden project on uh, on October nineteenth, twenty eleven, and it was show number one eighty seven. So if you want to pause this one and go back and dig that one up and listen to it. You don't need to because we're going to presume you haven't heard that one. So, and, and it's also the very same guest by some sort of a, um, amazing coincidence. Um, see if I can uh, mangle his name here. Uh, Onus Lettinen, something really close to that. He'll, he'll straighten me out if I got it too far off. Um, and so what Vaden is, I have a page I was going to pull up here. So except now I didn't pull it up right. Uh, so Vaden is... The Vaden platform consists of a set of web components, a Java web framework called Vaden Flow, configurable themes, tools, and a set of opinionated app starters. And platform ga releases gather all products into a single package every quarter. And I don't need to read that part of it. But basically, it's a way of building web apps where you can smartly design the entire data flow from your backend databases and whatever adapters you have for that, uh, all the way through the logic of getting from step to step and what happens when this button is pressed, what screen shows up then, or what things disappear and appear on the screen. And then the framework itself generates JavaScript and HTML that then get squirted out to your browser. So you're essentially looking at your browser, almost like it's a desktop app. In other words, it has that sort of look and feel. It has traditional familiar widgets and things like that. So very powerful platform. And, it, it, you know, we had them on seven years ago, but it, things have really changed since then. I'm, I'm, I'm really amazed at the, the – the, because I, I went back and watched the previous show just to see what it was like. And, yeah, things have definitely changed in the last seven years. So uh, what do you know about this so far? So I, I did also go back and listen to the previous show, uh, which is basically the first time I've heard of it. Um, but it, looking at it then, it seemed to be uh, kind of scratching his own itch, but in a, a more commercial way. So there was a, a project he was trying to work on, trying to set something up for someone. And none of the tools that are available seem really to fill the need that they had. And so they said, well, let's just set up this framework so that we can you know, build out this entire interface in Java, which... You know, some of us kind of shudder at the idea that we're doing it. We now have created full stack Java web coders as opposed to JavaScript web coders. But uh, it was interesting, though, to hear, to, to listen to his uh, kind of rationale and the way it came together. And the other thing that was interesting is it mainly it's designed for doing internal websites, internal dashboards for corporations, companies, 
uh, as people like that. And uh, I'm, I'm curious if that's still the case or if they've now moved to where they're doing uh, external facing, you know, public accessible websites, if that's kind of become the focus. So uh, it, it seems to be an interesting product. And I'm, I'm curious to hear what's happened in the last seven years. Well, and I'm, I uh, admit, I admitted this in Twitter a couple of times too, I admit that uh, Java is not one of my favorite languages, and I don't think the existence of a framework in this language is going to sway me, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. He might he might have me sold by the end of the show to actually go play with this a little bit, so uh, I have no idea whether that's going to happen or not. But before we bring him on, and which we will in a second, I do have a very important message. Because this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean provides the easiest cloud platform to deploy, manage, and scale applications with droplets, virtual machines that are a scalable compute platform with add-on storage, security, and monitoring capabilities. You can choose from standard or CPU-optimized droplets and customize from there. DigitalOcean is designed for developers. The easy-to-use control panel and API lets developers spend more time coding and less time managing their infrastructure. It's industry-leading price to performance. Access the compute resources you need at the lowest rates, saving up to 55% compared to other cloud providers. And you'll always know what you'll pay per month with a flat pricing structure across all data center regions. Included at no additional cost, 99.99% uptime SLA. Cloud firewalls. Monitoring and alerting, full DNS management, global data centers, enterprise SSDs, and an easy-to-use API. Over 150,000 businesses, including some of the world's fastest-growing startups, including mine, Stonehenge, rely on DigitalOcean to remove infrastructure friction and deliver industry-leading price performance. Sign up today and receive a free $100 credit at do.co slash floss. That's do.co slash F-L-O-S-S for a free $100 credit. And we thank DigitalOcean for their support of Floss Weekly. Now let's go ahead and bring on our guest, uh, Jonas. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Great to be here again. And uh, you're speaking to us from a different place. You're no longer in uh, Europe somewhere, right? You're uh, sort of on the West Coast somewhere? Yeah, I, I moved over to California, San Jose, like five years back. Okay, so Most of the this is in Finland, though. Yeah, this isn't so much of a time zone issue for you then. It's like, uh, well, you're right in the same slot that I am, and well, everybody except Jonathan on this call. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it was funny, you me, were kind of trying to translate the time zones for me, and what are yeah. they in Finland right now? So, Yeah, yeah, so that's great. So uh, give us the 30,000-foot view, okay? So what problem am I trying to solve when I reach for Vaden? Yeah, so... Uh, most probably uh, you are in a business setting with a team that is building a web application. Um, you probably have Java on the back end and you want to build a modern web app. And uh, then you look around and uh, see what what uh, frameworks provide a modern way of building things, where you find good components, what be the good uh, architecture to stick seeds together. And what VOD installs for you is that we give you the whole uh, stack starting from the Java and ending with the modern single page web application. So that's uh, basically it. So you are able to build a modern web app uh, from ready-made components. And then you can use those for internal purposes or for your product or whatever you're building. Okay. And uh, can you define modern web app for us? Yeah, I guess the, the simplest uh, thing or got, what people expect is that it's a single page web application. So everything uh, works within one page. Everything uh, responds immediately without any delays. What it revolves, uh, how the definition of re revolving today is that increasingly it means a progressive web application. And progressive meaning that you can actually install that to your handset or to your desktop and uh, it behaves increasingly like native application. And uh, so I think we asked this last time. I'm going to stop saying that for the rest of the show. Okay, I forget that there was a last show. Forget that there was a last show. It doesn't matter. <laughs> How did this project get started and why? Oh, yeah, that was a long time ago. In uh, 2000, I was uh, leading uh, a small team building a SaaS solution for healthcare. And uh, we kind of ended up thinking that there is nothing that would allow us to build a uh, a kind of a continuous desktop-like -like experience uh, with uh, proper developer experience. So we started scratching our own itch and and started a company uh, around building this framework. Okay, and so then you carried it forward. Was it originally open source, or did you think of doing that later? 
Yeah, the, the first couple of years, we, we were basically uh, really inexperienced, didn't know anything about business. We loved open source, but we, we first rolled it out as a service business, writing that uh, framework for ourselves. And in two years, we just couldn't keep it inside. We wanted to publish it without really knowing why. So it has been open source since 2002. And uh, so describe the process of interacting with this. So I'm writing Java code to describe uh, like the back end connections to my databases and things. And then I'm also writing like flow logic, business logic. And how yeah. does it all eventually end up on the browser? Yeah. So uh, let's start from the team itself. Probably uh, you either have a team that solely wants to speak uh, Java and doesn't want to touch web at all. So in that setting, you can write everything in Java, the back end logic, the UI logic, the layouts. Uh, can be 100% Java, and, and Vardin is probably one of the only frameworks that supports this. Uh, increasingly, teams are more of a polyglot teams where they start to uh, uh, wants to uh, write JavaScript and HTML on the front end side, and in those cases, you can use HTML templates and add a JavaScript logic logic to the UI as well. And this is, so is that, one big thing ahead, that sorry. has been changing since the last time we spoke. Okay, so uh, so uh, so let me get get this right. So I'm I'm I, if I do have front end developers who are familiar and want to have more precise control, or maybe embed Vaden's um, uh, widgets in the middle of their own layout that they already have existing, it, I would I would have to use like a some some specific JavaScript uh, uh, framework, or are you compatible with a lot of them? Yeah. You, um so Vardin basically has three parts. There is tooling, there is uh, this Java framework called Flow, and there is uh, library web components. And you can use both, uh, both all of these independently. So if you are using today, let's say Angular or React, you can just go and use any of Vardin's components uh, as is without any connection to Java or any, any tooling from Vardin's side. So you can basically pick and choose. Okay, and uh, sorry for that. Um, the um, um, so so, and I'm still still kind of trying to figure out the flow of everything. Not to overuse the word flow here, but so um, uh, what? Where where does the JavaScript and HTML for the web components that uh, Vaden is providing come from? Is this generated dynamically from? the Java code I write for the back end, or is this something that's static, but just happens to know how to talk APIs to the back end? Yeah, so if your preference is, is sticking, uh, kind of uh, staying fully on the Java side of, of things, then you can write your UI code as uh, uh, you would be writing a desktop like UI code, let's say Swing. So you can, in Java, say uh, a new button and add that button to a layout and Vardin uh, Flow takes care of everything else. It automatically builds all the communication between browser and the server, automatically downloads correct web components, automatically wires them up and, and passes events between the server and the client. So that is the kind of the magic source in, in, in Vardin. But if you are a front-end team and you want to uh, start your flow by drawing the UIs, uh, prototype the UIs in HTML, you can just use Vardin's components as any standard web components. And then the Java, or I don't know, Node or PHP backend team can later on sticks, uh, th put things together. Uh, Jonas, I want to ask a couple of additionally technical questions. Uh, what uh, what web server does this generally sit on top of? Uh, does Vaadin provide its own, or is it on top of Nginx or Apache or any of the above? What does that look like? Um, Nowadays, most teams, they end up starting with Spring Boot. So uh, most of the audience, they are Java oriented, and that's the, the way how they found Vardin. And in, in, in space of Java, uh, Spring Boot is, is, I think, the most uh, strong option to start with right now. And is there flexibility to be able to go to one of the other web servers? Uh, so, for example, Nginx is known for being able to scale up to huge uh, installs. Is that supported or, or uh, is the so user on their own that to set that up? A, anything that can run a Java servlet, you can use. So, and so basically all the clouds, uh, they support uh, deploying a servlet already. So you can run it on any public cloud or you can run it with uh, any, any server that supports servlets. 
Okay. And then what about the back end? I assume that uh, this is set up to be able to talk to a database uh, same, basically the same question. Is that one that's built into Vaadin? Is there a specific database that you prefer? Uh, no, you can use anything. So it's uh, the, what we basically are sitting on top is, is uh, Java ecosystem in there. And Java ecosystem provides a really good connection to basically anything you can think of on, on the backend side. Okay. And then, so this connection between, you, you, you kind of piqued my interest when you talked about this, this smart single page web interface. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a problem we were trying to solve for a different project, and we needed a single page interface that also used a single uh, long running SSL connection. So basically, a, a single TCP connection. Is yep. does Vaden set this up in the same way so that you know you can? What we were wanting to be able to do is open a port, make the SSL connection, and then close the port back and still be able to get into it as long as the page was up. Is that is that how this works? Yeah, so uh, if you write the hello world in, in, in Vaadin, with all the defaults, what you get is uh, Ajax-based communication. But if you add there one annotation at push in your UI, then it automatically switches over to web sockets and keeps the connection open. So let's say if you use cases that uh, you have a long list of data on the server side that is changing and you put VAD in data grid on the screen, that connection between your server-side data models and grid is automatically maintained. Any new items pops up automatically on that data grid. When you scroll around, it automatically fetches new data from the server side. So all the hard parts are taken care of by VADIN. It's interesting. I'll have to keep this in mind for the, yeah. <laughs> if that project ever is breathed life into it again, we'll, we'll definitely take a look. So what what sorts of you talk about widgets? What sorts of widgets does Vaadin have? I, I'm still trying to kind of wrap my mind around uh, what a use case would be for this specifically. Yeah, it's a bit boring actually. So uh, <laughs> it seems that the, all the business applications uh, that's the space where we are. All the insurance companies and healthcare companies and even like space companies they basically end up having forms and grids and uh, some visualizations in there. So what we provide is, is exactly that, like form components and grids and visualizations and layouts and, and so forth. So these are fairly, I would say, uh, generic low level components, the building blocks that you can build the whole UI out of. So uh, an example that Vadin maybe gets used for is like, uh, you go to a hospital for the first time and they have a patient portal where they yep. can push documents back and forth and get you to sign off on things. Is that is that maybe one of the use cases? That's really typical. And uh, I think right now, at least one fourth of the US healthcare is running uh, uh, on, on Vaadin based systems. So it, it's really widely used in those, but nobody who is using actually knows that they're using using Vaadin as it's uh, just a layer for the developers to, to make it easier for them to develop and maintain it. Yeah, and so we're scrolling through just some of the components that that uh, Vaadin supports, and that looks to be quite a, an impressive list of different things. Um, what are uh, what are some of the things here that you're either real proud of or or find to be real interesting? I think it's the same thing for every uh, UI library. So everything ends up being a grid framework. So data grids are, uh, I would say, order of magnitude more um, hard to do than anything else in the UI. And this has been the case for Vaadin for since uh, we started. So data grid is, is the top one component. And many many companies they just end up uh, starting with the data grid. They might not even they might hate Java with passion, and they they use just the data grid. And then they see oh yeah there is we need this date picker as well. And then they started to grow on on that one by one. Uh -huh. And so um, just thinking about some of the other uses, because you, could you? Take Vaadin and basically rebuild um, Gmail and G apps, Google Docs, all of those things. Yeah, definitely. Uh, some of the uh, kind of parts of, of Google Docs are tricky, and there is no ready-made components for the, them. So uh, let's say in Google Docs, that the area where you write the standard rich text area uh, wouldn't do you much good. So that's really custom built for for Google Docs. Or in Spreadsheet, we actually have a Spreadsheet component, but uh, 
but but uh, many of those things are custom built and in those cases Vardin just provides you ways of building more components. Yeah, go ahead and, and dig into that a little bit because I'm curious about that. How does it how does it work to build a custom component and get it integrated into your website? And then what are the options for somebody being able to turn around and say, "Hey, I built this thing. I'll let everybody else use it." Uh, can you can a user uh, sh- send their components back up to the the Vaden? Oh, I assume there's a repository of components that you guys uh, have available. Yeah. So. Uh- I think it was around uh, five, six years back, uh, this thing called Web Components was uh, uh, a new uh, idea that Chrome team started to work around and, and started to build support for. And, and we were kind of scared. We have been building uh, components uh, for web for way too many years. And now when Google started building a standard around that, that it actually became a part of the HTML standard later. Uh, we decided that, yeah, we have to embrace this. And we actually went and rebuilt everything that we had as web components. So this is a real standard. Any of those components uh, work today in pretty much any web browser and pretty much any web framework as, as well. So what you do is you basically build a new web component with whatever means you, you want to. Our components are built with a framework called Polymer but you can use anything that you want. And then you just uh, annotate to Vardin flow, what is the name of the component and where you load that from. And it automatically builds that connection between uh, your component and the server side. And then you can start uh, kind of exposing the API uh, for your Java developers, if that's what you want. And uh, to get that into Vardin ecosystem, uh, either you do nothing, you be publish that on GitHub, but you can go one step further and click the Vardin directory and uh, from our website and uh, choose publish over there, and you ca- your component can then be uh, joining the. I think that there is like 1,400 components right now, uh, one of those, and that way they our uh, community uh, finds the, those much easier than if you would just leave them on your repository on GitHub. Mm-hmm. Now, how, how do you handle the possibility of a, a malicious component, or even maybe not even malicious, but just a poorly written component? Is there is there some sort of a uh, vetting uh, process, or how, do, how does that uh, come about? There is not. So we haven't, uh, since we have had the directory there for 10 years, we haven't had any malicious components uh, at all. So that's a good news. Although we have seen uh, our share of poor components that might be uh, working uh, somewhat uh, in a limited fashion or be broken here and there. And uh, I think that's something that we just have to accept. So we, w- when we kind of opened up the directory, that was a solution how to contribute back to the framework. We, before that, we expected people to send patches to the actual framework and our component set. And the bar was way too high on, on that one. And then we opened up this open directory, pretty much modeled after a Apple App Store, where you could submit anything. And then other people go and rate them, uh, add comments. And uh, it basically the kind of community self-curates that list. Mm-hmm. Uh, so to get onto that directory, is there a, a licensing uh, requirement? You know, it's got to be uh, AGPL maybe or GPL2 or LGPL. What, what does that look like? We support pretty much any any open source licenses. But the source has to be available to get on there. Uh, yes. Uh, so the you could build on top of a commercial component that is closed source and pretty much kind of send the wrapping. A wrapper to the directory, but uh, almost everything over there is open source. Okay, and so we're we're scrolling through these, and uh, of course, there's a bunch of them. Um, are all of these uh, free to you? So I don't know if I, we want to get into this quite yet, but uh, there is, of course, a you guys make money. You're a company. Are all of these free to use, or are some of them uh, behind a quote unquote paywall? Um, Ninety nine Pro this is free to use. Uh, in really early days of directory, we were inspired by the. Uh, what could be the commercial ecosystem built in there. And, and we did set it up in a such way that you could sell your components in there. It didn't work out, at least not back then. So 
we then closed uh, down any any kind of a way of reselling components and it's now mostly free and open source all right so we've, so, we've talked about the go, go ahead yeah i'm uh, so the only exception over there is that we have submitted our commercial components to that list as well so that okay. user can find those more easy but that that's about it sure so we've we've talked about some of the typical uses of Vaden, and I always find interesting the uh, the strange and atypical uses of some of these projects. What is the weirdest thing that someone is doing with Vaden that you're aware of? That's a good question. I, I think uh, I was most uh, impressed when the uh, the first uh, European Space Agency uh, started using it and. Then some DNA storage company started using it. And when you start seeing those use cases where you don't really understand them that, that much, but they sound cool and, and science fiction, that, that's, uh, that, that's always compelling. And one of my favorites was uh, when NASA, they, they are simulating self-flying uh, self drones, kind of swarm of those. And then they built this uh, controlling system for those uh, self flying drones with Vardin, and then they ended up uh, uh, using that from, from iPad. That was uh, many years back when it was a cool thing to, and a new thing to, to run, run web apps from, from iPads. Well, that actually brings up a technical question. What kinds of uh, browsers and devices do you support? Uh, pretty much everything since IE 11. So we... Uh, we actually still maintain old uh, framework version seven that supports everything since IE eight. But nowadays, all the all the major browsers are supported. All the major mobile platforms are supported. I will not be sad the day IE finally goes away. <laughs> no one is. <laughs> I, I, that, we'll all be a, partying. Yeah, we'll all be partying. Like, oh yeah. my God, we don't have to worry about IE anymore. That really crazy, crufty browser that comes yeah. out of Redmond. Yeah, you wouldn't anyway. believe the number of discussions we have had internally where I had had to shut down the, the idea of hey, could we stop supporting IE altogether? And then said, yeah, we have many of these enterprise customers who really still are forced to be supporting IE 11. Uh, Emily the Strange has a really great question. It's timely. Uh, any difference in their support for mobile browsers versus desktop browsers? No, not nothing. So mobile browsers are super capable nowadays. And all the components that we rebuilt from scratch, they are built mobile first. Cool, cool. And uh, this will be a, maybe a touchy question, but uh, uh, we do. Uh, I know some of my audience is already screaming about this. So... Um, when we last chatted, oh, I didn't, so I was not going to refer to that again, but let's just say six or seven years ago, as I recall, becoming aware of this project, how's that? I'll just put it that way. Uh, it seemed like everything was open source. Am I mistaken, or has that now changed in the last six or seven years? I think seven years back, we had some commercial tooling already back then. Um, but it, so uh, I'm not completely sure that I, I think we had at least uh, a test bands already back then. It's a commercial tool for regression testing voting applications. Okay. And what's your decision to be able to say some of this is open source and some of this is commercial? How do you how do you decide which belongs into which bin? That is a really, really tough question that we ponder and debate every day. So as a background, voting is uh, uh, it's a company it fully lives out of uh, supporting companies who use Vardin uh, framework for for building their applications so we have to have a way of funding what we do uh, and uh, we have always had this guiding principle that uh, Vardin uh, the, the core of Vardin is always free and it should be capable for most use cases so that nobody is forced to pay anything uh, where we can add some uh, um, uh, further developer uh, a bit better developer experience, speed up the development a bit, add a bit more advanced components for you, then we might uh, conjure to, to have a price tag on, on those. Okay, and since this is uh, at least the open core part of it is open source, do you find a lot of outside contributions or pull requests or at least uh, trouble tickets on that part? Uh, yeah, quite a bit. So <laughs> mostly always issues, but a lot of pull requests as, as well. And as Vardin is, is used in uh, for building huge business applications, many of those uh, 
companies contribute back regardless whether they are uh, customers of ours or just using the open source parts. Okay, well, that's a good sign. And, and uh, unlike some of the, a few of the recent projects we've had on here, um, people are able to dog food in this because if you're trying to make things better, you're probably already a Java programmer who can probably uh, edit it. You're not just an end user of this product. Yeah, that that's true. And one of the reasons why we um, wanted to have a really liberal Apache open source license for this was that it kind of uh, gives a warranty for anybody who's using that. So if they don't like how the how we guide the project, they can always go and fork and maintain it by themselves. So that is a kind of strong agreement between the between the team who who builds the technology and the, the developers who use the technology. So uh, Emily actually has another question. She's a frequent contributor here in the, the forum. Um, so do they work with security protocols like TLS for submitting the forms, or is that handled by something else? Yeah, most of the applications, they use uh, just HTTPS and, and any security protocols in, in there. So... Uh, we, we are uh, build, We are building on top of a standard web platform, so the security comes from there. Uh, one maybe thing to point out, and that's uh, also a reason why many banks and financial institutions like to use Vardin, is that when you build things on the server side, uh, you have less code that is exposed to your users and, and uh, whoever might be uh, want to, wanting to attack your application. So it increases security quite a bit. Cool. And so do you have automatic serialization and deserialization of business objects across the wire? Uh, so the, how it, it kind of sends uh, updates from the server to client is that it, it looks what has changed in those components. It doesn't send all of it, but it sends the changes and synchronizes those components between server and the browser. Okay, but if I if I've built custom JavaScript and HTML to display an object coming from the server uh, and delivered under my own layout, um, how will it know the fields that have changed? Is there there's some sort of handshaking and, and detailed documentation on that? Oh, so if you are building the, the the communication by yourself, then we then you are on your own. You are basically just using Vardin components as as they are. So there you you can provide a client-side data model that you can bind to, let's say, data grid. Um, and you can, for that, take a look of the documentation. Uh, but for the communication part, then you are on your own. So obviously this is in production use because it's been around for a while. Um, what's still some of the sore points that you really hope to get rid of eventually about developing in Vaadin? Uh That's a good question. Right now, what we are that that is uh, kind of a uh, causing a lot of uh, questions is the programming model. I mean, uh, we have two audiences that we are serving right now: the the Java developers that might hate JavaScript with a passion, and the JavaScript developers who might hate Java with passion. And we try <laughs> to be this uh, in the middle, in the between, and say that hey, guys, let's be friends. And uh, just kind of uh, telling the story in a way that both sides understand what they get out of Vardin, that is a bit uh, challenging always. And uh, looking at the limitations on, of the server-side model and, and from the Java developers, there is one hard limitation that we cannot solve on that part, and that's offline use cases. So if you want to uh, have your application that uh, run offline for a bit, you have to build those parts uh, on the on the client side. And I'll uh, have to st go ahead, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. No, oh, I was just going to say I, I and then there are the people uh, myself included who uh, hate both Java and JavaScript. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes. yeah, you'll never please me no matter how you write your docs. It's not going to be, <laughs> it's not going to be happy for me on that. Uh, Emily, actually another great question here. Uh, um, where did the name Vaden come from? Yeah, that's uh, it's a Finnish word, as, as we are originally from Finland. Uh, Finnish word meaning uh, female reindeer. How the, how oh. is that to do with what in uh, the framework? I don't know, but it was a cool name. And even if you can see the logo over here, there are kind of horns and nose of the reindeer. So we are fans of, of reindeers. 
So, so you actually have ASCII art in your logo. Nice. <laughs> I don't know how many other people do that. That's that's pretty crazy. Um, what about testing? I mean, uh, what kind of testing frameworks can you make with this? And can you do essentially end-to-end -end testing, maybe with something like uh, – oh, I forget the names of the things that run in the browser that can uh, I mean, like check Selenium things out. Or... Yeah, Selenium, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we have a test tool called Varin Test Bands, and it's actually uh, built on top of Selenium. And with that, you can make end-to-end uh, -end testing for, for our, our Varin applications. You could use uh, Selenium as is as well, but then there is a bit more plumbing that you would have to do. So Varin Test Bands is, is highly tuned for testing Varin applications. So it's maybe it opens a side channel to the back end to say, I'm, I'm about to look for these sorts of things or something like that? Uh, it, it basically kind of runs the web application with WebDriver, provides you an API that uh, you can write your tests against and uh, even take screenshots of different areas of your application, compares those pixel by pixel, and reports you on where it can see uh, differences on how it looks or how the contents of fields are behaving and so forth. And uh, I dare ask this again, uh, are you... Uh, What's your internal code coverage? Do you have uh, most of your lines of code uh, touched by your own internal uh, testing beds? Uh, now I must say I don't know what's the what's the percentage. Uh, <laughs> we, we run tens and tens of thousands of tests for for Varin uh, for every release, so it's it's really extensively tested. But uh, I don't really I'm not really believing that having like hundred percent code coverage would be or test coverage would be even a good thing. And sometimes it's it's darn near impossible because you have to create a uh, should never happen situation sometimes, and that's really really tough to take that branch. And you just hope that if that situation this never should happen actually happens, uh, that that code will just work right. So, completely understand that. Um, so uh, again, the, the, what's sort of the smallest project that I would want to pull down Vadden for? I mean, there's probably. Probably not useful to be like a hello world because you do a whole lot of infrastructure setup just to be able to get that hello world box up. Um, what's sort of the, the minimal place where you would reach for Vaden? I mean that uh, the range is, is quite large, so it, it's quite widely used for uh, uh, school projects in in universities for. Oh building your uh, couple of week of uh, exercise uh, for, I don't know, learning basics of programming. And on the other end, it's used in, in huge enterprises uh, for building systems that are used by hundreds of thousands of employees. So the range is, is huge. But obviously, you get more benefits when your team gets larger. So that that's, uh, uh, you know, that, that way, uh, we see more and more large applications using it. So uh, let's talk about scaling then, because that sounds uh, very important for this stuff. How do you scale this? Is this something where you could put uh, a bunch of machines behind a load balancer, and it, it it does it need affinity then, or can it go to any one of the back ends? Yeah, you can. So it, scaling is like uh, anything else. Basically, you put more front end servers to to scale out as as much as you want to. One thing that we require is is sticky sessions. So one user who is using the application should always go to the same same backend servers. But hey, so the I, I wanna, are pretty much supported by everything nowadays. I want to jump in. Um, Randall and I just flubbed that handshake just a little bit. Um, so you, you mentioned the difficulty of running Vaden offline. And I'm, I'm curious, does that mean that if I have a dedicated server where I connect it to the internet and grab all of the different components of it. Can I then unplug that server from the internet and take it out somewhere that doesn't have internet connectivity? Can I then use a application built on Vaden, or does it have to be connected to the internet for this to work? Uh, sure, you can do that. And we see a lot of uh, governmental organizations and military organizations doing exactly that. They don't want to run their stuff on, on public internet. But with exactly. offline, I meant that uh, if the users are offline, they are they don't have connection to the server at all. In those cases, uh, the server side programming model doesn't really work. Sure, sure. Um, and then, what? How much? How much hardware is required to run on that server? So, um, one of the things that comes to mind for something like this is: can you run it on a Raspberry Pi? How much processing power do you need? Definitely, you can run quite a few uh, users on on a Raspberry Pi. So. 
No, no worries about that. I, I don't see that uh, hardware would be a limiting factor to to run it in this in any embedded environment, and we see in our share of embedded use cases as well. Does it does it basically run on um, any infrastructure that can run Java? Yeah. So if you can get JVM to run and you have, I don't know, thirty megabytes of of memory on top of that, then you would be good to go. Okay, and then we we may have discussed this briefly, but I wanted to ask again: what what license, what which open source license is all this under? And then why did you make the decision to use that license? Uh, yeah, everything is under Apache Two license, so it's a really liberal license that you can basically do anything with. Uh, we started with uh, LGPL. That was the something we we loved uh, loved Linux and G, G, GNU ecosystem, and we were looking that uh, uh, just the GPL would be too restricting for our users. User basically being big companies that don't want to uh, uh, kind of commit uh, forever for for using Vardin and and be bound to Vardin the company. So we chose LGPL. Uh, it was good from legal perspective, but uh, many companies came back to us uh, confusing that with GPL license. And uh, that was pretty much the only reason why we switched over to Apache license to kind of get rid of this confusion. Were there any growing pains in trying to make that license change? Some, sometimes relicensing a project can be a nightmare. Uh, was that a difficult thing or pretty easy for you guys? It was pretty easy for us as as uh, we uh, own the copyrights for all the core parts of Vardin, and we still do. So we try to maintain ownership of the copyright so that uh, we wouldn't have to drive ourselves to corner where where we cannot uh, solve our user problem on the licensing side. Uh, so is there a, is there an agreement like copyright attribution for someone sending in patches? Yeah. So there is a contributor agreement uh, where you basically assign copyright for the lines that you would be uh, patching up to to Vardin core and then you get unlimited license to those for yourself. Okay, uh, fair enough. So we have another uh, question from the chat room again, Emily the Strange, who is apparently the only person watching live. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> any use, <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. <laughs> any use cases that can be used by regular people in everyday use? So not enterprise or business, any use for more mundane tasks? Are you aware of mundane uses? Uh, for example, there was one guy in, in Canada who built uh, um, kind of a, a application for running weightlifting competitions in, in Canada. So that was a really cool use case that I, I would never have thought of, of that somebody would like to build uh, something like that for their hobby. If somebody so, wanted to, they they could probably build a home automation dashboard with Vaadin, I would imagine. Yeah, I'm, I'm certain of that. So getting started with Vaadin is super simple, and that's uh, the reason why many like one-person teams or hobbyists are uh, are starting with Vaadin. <laughs> okay. Um, and then what's the release cadence of Vaadin look like? How often do you uh, release a new... Uh, point release, new major release. Uh, what does that look like? Yeah, we just uh, shifted over to quarterly releases for a volume platform uh, uh, this year. So we are releasing one volume platform release every quarter. And uh, the promise is that at least every two years, we label one of those as a long-term supported releases. And long-term supported meaning here that we really guarantee that we maintain it for at least five years. And uh, we actually are shortly rolling out uh, an extended maintenance for big enterprises for 15 years. So we take this uh, long-term viability really seriously. I'm, I'm quickly doing a little math here. Four times five. You have 20 different releases that you're going to be supporting all at once? No, no, no. So uh, we only uh, support those LTS releases. So the intermediate releases, uh, the quarterly releases that we have, these are supported only for four months. So if you want to get the latest and greatest, you could uh, write on the on the latest uh, uh, quarterly release, release. And if you want to have something that's long time stable, then you use some LTS long term supported release. 
So you said most of your customers are enterprise customers for internal uh, infrastructure websites and, and applications. Is is Vaadin suitable also, though, for external websites? Is it secure enough? Uh, does it have enough flexibility? Uh, so actually, uh, that the, the internal system is it's just the half of it. Another half is uh, companies building SaaS products. So that's really popular use case as well. Um, we always have been gearing towards uh, applications that are more uh, more of a kind of data intensive than just websites. But we actually built Vaadi.com with Vaadin Flow. So that is a website built with Vaadin Flow. And oh, right now nice. for a that's kind of read only or kind of a browsing oriented website, I wouldn't be recommending Vaadin for, for that use case. So it's a maybe a bit too... Uh, heavy or complex tool for 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 a, such a basic use case where you have a static html okay but but vaden.com itself is, is done with vaden I, I think that's great and you're eating your own dog food on that um what about things like uh, authentication are there widgets to do like oauth or whatever the modern thing is equivalent to that yeah so um I, uh, we have seen people using oauth we do have a login component uh, as as well and quite often people use uh, a framework like Spring Security for for the uh, uh, authorizations in, in there. Okay, because that's always the thing to get, you got to get right, because if you don't get it right, you'll get you'll get in the news. So it's like, yeah. <laughs> yet you don't want to be in the news about something like a data breach. I tell you, that is definitely not a good place to be. So uh, we're almost out of time. We're starting to wrap up here. Um, uh, I think there was one more question from the list that I wanted to cover here. Oh yeah, so so uh, give us give us the, the three or four minute spiel about or shorter about why Vaadin instead of there's like dozens of other frameworks including GWT. I presume that's your biggest competitor in this space. Um, why you and not them? Yeah, I mean, if you use Java, uh, then the choice is fairly uh, simple as as there are not that many frameworks that are really supporting Java developers and for connecting uh, them to, to modern uh, techniques on, on the web uh, web platform side. And uh, sure, there are many frameworks uh, and like Java server phases and GWT and so forth. But if you look at how well these are maintained today and what's the future of them, there is not that much uh, drive behind them. So if, if you are a Java team, I think uh, uh, just looking at what Vaadin has to offer, it's a uh, it's pretty obvious choice. If you are not a Java team, then it becomes way too, uh, way uh, harder. So on on the front-end space, uh, React, Vue, and Angular are pretty much the choices. Uh, you can choose any of those and then go and pick and choose any components from Vaadin that you want to use. Oh, that'd be awesome! Cool. And uh, so, what's on the roadmap? What's coming up next? What's your and uh, what if you since this is an open source, open core project? Uh, what kind of people are you looking for in particular to help with you with uh, contributions? Um, so uh, the, the the kind of detailed roadmap you can find that from wadi.com slash roadmap. But if you look a bit uh, further along, we put our energy in in supporting the front end teams and the collaboration between Java and front-end teams and Java and front-end teams and, and designers um, more closely. So we want to optimize the workflow between between those guys and make Vaadin increasingly productive for them. So that's where we spend our time nowadays. Uh, for contributions, uh, everything is, is really welcome. So if you want to <laughs> uh, write tutorials, if you want to... Uh, patch documentation, solve any of the issues in the Vaadin core, or just write new components, uh, all of that would be would be great and welcome. How's your internationalization? Uh, so we, uh, speak of documentation, we, we had this book of Vaadin for a long time, and, and we still have it for seven and eight versions. For 10 and beyond, we moved over to the website. And we no saw some guys all over the world translating the whole book to different languages. Like we had Chinese version and French version and Spanish version of it. So that was amazing uh, community contributions because those were, so that's some people around the world who thought that it would be a cool thing to translate the whole book to, to their language. 
So we actually had another uh, question from the chat room uh, just before we have to let you go here. So uh, uh, T. Marks asks, does the client also need to have Java installed? No, definitely not. So I don't really believe that anybody would like to run Java on their, their client side. Okay. So I it's just pure web server, on the client side. Yeah. <laughs> I said I could say the same thing about server side, but okay, stop that, Randall. Stop, stop beating up Java. Stop beating up Java. What has it ever done to you? <laughs> well, it's cost me time. Anyway, so uh, uh, like I said, we're almost out of time. Uh, oh, uh, and I think we covered everything on that little list. Uh, yeah. Okay. Good. Well, we're 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 mostly out of questions here. So, is there any question we didn't ask that you wanted to make sure our audience is aware of before we have to let you go? Uh. I think we were having a pretty good coverage and, and the question that I have to, to audiences is how do you really uh, bridge the gap between uh, how people from front end side and the, from the Java side see the world because it would be great to be able to convince them that it they can uh, coexist and, and collaborate and that uh, Java is not just a language, it's uh, really uh, wide ecosystem around JVM and web is not just the JavaScript as a language, but it's a really cool runtime that provides a great user experience. So how to see how to kind of get people to to, to better go along and uh, see these two platforms coexisting. Yeah, and I have like a one uh... One throwaway question, but it's um, uh, and then I have two more questions. So you get three in a row more now still. Um, can you theme the components to provide, say, company logo colors or uh, some sort of uh, uh, pleasant-looking uh, things on my screen? Absolutely. So everything that we, we have built is, is built to be themable. And we actually come out of the box with two themes. Uh, and uh, the one of those themes is, is such that you can easily uh, tune the colors and the spacing and the uh, roundness and gradients and whatnot uh, across all the components. Okay, okay, and then the last two questions I have to ask every audience, or every audience member, <laughs> I'm asking this to every audience member right now. <laughs> if you're in the audience, please answer these two questions. <laughs> Just don't email it in, <laughs> don't, don't flood my email <laughs> box. Uh, so what's your favorite scripting language? Oh, wow. That's a good question. Uh, I don't have any favorites in, in there. Uh, we, My background, uh, uh, before I jumped into Vardy, we were writing huge applications in Perl, and I can say that that's not my favorite language, so <laughs> maybe, maybe that's the oh. problem. <laughs> oh, I had my hands in the air for the usual congratulation <laughs> things, and, and, and so, okay, so what is it if it's not Perl? Um. Um, I'm... Not writing that much uh, scripting. If I uh, write something, I tend to use uh, JavaScript and Node more than anything else, I guess. Oh, well, that's a perfectly solid answer to that. And what text editor do you edit all this stuff in? Uh, so I, I love Vim, but uh, uh, for coding, uh, I normally run IntelliJ. IntelliJ, yeah, that makes sense, especially when there's so much Java uh, things in there. And IntelliJ also talks, I think, JavaScript too, so you can kind of do HTML and JavaScript layout with that. Yeah, pretty much everything. So it's uh, awesome. It's an amazing environment. I'm using VS Code for all that because it does that all for free and it's open source, which I really like. Yeah, that, so. that's great as well. So I really like yeah. VS Code. VS but Code the, is the Java support in there is a bit kind of uh, rough still. It's getting better, but. Uh, yeah, yep, yep, not, yep, not on yep. the same level as in the LJ. I hope to have the VS Code people on a future show. And I have three times talked to somebody who said, I will definitely get somebody in touch with you. And they haven't. So if anybody's listening that's on the VS Code team, please contact me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. I will be happy to get you on a show soon. Please, please, please. This is such an amazing thing that Microsoft has created this really wonderful cross-platform uh, editor that's entirely open source and does some amazing stuff. So, And runs a lot faster than IntelliJ. I just have to say that because it's, it's Electron, and so it's a lot faster for that. Anyway, enough of that. Hey, it's been a great time talking to you, catching up with you. After all these years, you haven't written, you haven't called. I didn't know what was going on. So, <laughs> thanks, we can do this every seven me. years, I guess. Every seven <laughs> years, I'll put I'll put it on the calendar. I'll spread the spreadsheet all the way down seven years, and you'll just be a slot on there. It'll be yeah. awesome. <laughs> Presuming I'm still doing this show in seven years, you're more than welcome to come back. So, thank you for talking about Vaden and possibly introducing a whole new uh, group of people. Well, definitely introducing this to a whole new group of people uh, since last time. So, um, uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. 
great to be here. Great. That was uh, Onas Lethenthin, Lethenthin, something like that. Anyway, uh, Lethenthin, there we go. Okay. Uh, so what do you think there, uh, um, uh, Jonathan? <laughs> I don't remember your name, too. Oh. Uh, they let anybody do this show. It's pretty obvious. Yeah, All right. Uh, yeah. I think it's I think it's always interesting to uh, come back to these projects that we haven't talked to for long that we've talked to but not talked to for several years to see the difficult decisions they've had to make and what's changed and specifically with this one how they've uh, ever so slightly moved away from the pure open source model to most of its open source and we've got some things that are proprietary and uh, you know people have all kinds of different opinions about that uh, but I think it's very interesting that. You, these people are having to make these hard decisions and to be able to come back and say, well, what, what happened that led you to do this? Um, and then also it's, it's neat to be able to find out about these new projects, even, even if they do, you know, lead to full stack Java programmers, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which neither of us will ever be. Um, no, but no. it's at the same time, it's, it's cool that, Somebody that uses that you know that's familiar with Java that uses Java can use this open source uh, framework and be able to get stuff done. And I think it's neat. I think it's a cool project. Yeah, and then as I said in Twitter somewhere, I said to uh, to uh, Java is like uh, let's see what is it? Um, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a thumb. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I'm going to leave my Java bashing at that because I think that's that's the pinnacle for today. But um, so yeah, well, it, it, I actually, as you were saying that, I had this idea that um, you know if we went back to the uh, 499 shows that have been done as of today, I wonder how many projects are still alive. And how many projects have died since then? And if we could do any sort of post-mortem analysis on them, like I have tons of spare time to do this. But, uh, you know, I, I'm wondering, you know, can we derive then what makes an open source project have longevity? Uh, because we've had uh, something like three or four in the last year where they've come back after, you know, six, seven, ten years. And, of course, the project has gone way further than that they were imagining back that far ago. Um, so I'm, that does seem like an interesting point of research. It, maybe there's some people out there looking for a, a, a doctorate thing, <laughs> you know, come talk to me <laughs> about analyzing all my past shows and talking about open source and seeing where that is. Uh, and I wish I had all that data for our next guest, uh, because our next guest next week is Vicky Bersour, who uh, has actually just come out with a book called, uh, contributing to open source, but she has a long history with the open source communities, all of them, uh, been a keynote speaker many, many places, uh, well-received. Uh, uh, she's just a, a great leader to talk to. And it's lucky because it also happens to be show number 500. So uh, that's very, very appropriate that we're talking about generic open source as, as a technology, as a, as a community, as a, as a way of doing things, as a way of being uh, on our 500th show because it really brings it home. So uh, following that, we have Sway, which is a tiling Wayland compositor and drop-in replacement for the i3 window manager for X11. To me, those buzzwords mean absolutely nothing, except X11. I know what that is. Uh, I'm not running it anywhere, of course, but there it is. So it works with your existing i3 configuration, supports most of i3's features, plus a few extras. Again, I have no idea what all it is. So hopefully my co-host in two weeks is an X11 or Wayland guy or something like that. I don't know. We'll have to figure something out for that. Open Rhinewer coming up after that, the German Open Source Two-Day Conference in early November. Uh, Monero, for those of you that have been dying for more blockchain stuff on this show, because I know there's a few of you out there, right? Uh, Monero, which is uh, cryptocurrency but private, untraceable, and fungible. They were scheduled originally for a, a couple months ago, and then they uh, they kind of uh, blanked out, and so they're rescheduled now. Uh, Tidelift uh, gives maintainers and core teams uh, the way to get paid for doing the work they love. Tidelift provides um, – uh, oops, I just lost – Last location here, uh, deliver a professional software experience. Okay, uh, just added to the schedule, uh, the the owner approached me about this, Invoice Ninja. It's a powerful suite of online tools to invoice clients, collect payments, create proposals, expenses, time tasks, and more. And when I say open source, it is truly open source. You can host it yourself or you can use their hosted solutions. Um uh, there's a free tier for small uh, companies like me, so uh, I'm getting signed up for it right away. That'll be really cool. Um, 
And, uh, and, and, but, but it's, what's even better, and this is really apropos for me right now, they have a Flutter application that is in late beta, and their source code for their Flutter application is also in their GitHub. So they are really committed, top to bottom, to open source. And so I'm really looking forward to this. So uh, that's coming up, I think, in early November, November 14th or something like that. Um, again, fully open source. Uh, if you want to add more people to that list, if you want to get more people on the show, then uh, here's the way it works. Go to twit.tv slash floss. That's the big spreadsheet. If somebody is not on there that you want to be on that list, Please contact that project, the project uh, uh, leader or the community coordinator, typically one of the two, and have them email me, Merlin at Stonehenge.com. My address is, in fact, on that sheet, so you don't have to actually figure out where I'm at. Um, so uh, uh, we have a live stream at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time on Wednesdays at live.twit.tv. We took a number of questions from there, mostly from Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, uh, River Mike, um, for at least suggesting a question, which I never got to. Sorry about that. Uh, you can follow us on Floss Weekly at Google Plus and at Floss Weekly on Twitter. You can follow me as Randall L. Schwartz on Google Plus and at Merlin on Twitter. I am going to be in all things open in what's left of Raleigh, North Carolina. Actually, I've heard there's not much damage that for far end, so it'll probably be just fine. Maybe a couple trees knocked down or something. Okay. I am both press and speaker. I'm actually delivering my flutter talk there again. I'll be at Seagull in November, which is in Seattle. We had uh, the coordinator for that uh, on our show a couple months ago. I'll only be press there. And I'm also going to be at KubeCon or Kubacon because it's like, you know, Kubernetes. Did you say Kubacon? I don't know. And Xanadu did Kubacon. All right, never mind. <laughs> That's the worst poetry ever. <laughs> uh, I'll be there in December again as press. And that's also up in Seattle. So I'm going to have a great time up there. And uh, um, uh, Jonathan, I hear you want to plug something. I, I do want to plug something. First, I want to say we are 13 shows away from a significant show number, not one. <laughs> Some of you will get really? that later. Oh, 512 yeah. instead of 500. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's fine. <laughs> then we'll overflow the bits and then we won't be able to do any more shows, right? We'll start with negative shows. Um, yes. No, so I've I've recently landed a gig as one of the writers over at Hackaday, and one of my uh, first columns have come, Hack My House, and it is about what a hacker does when he is remodeling a house. And so the first one is up talking about using Raspberry Pis as a, kind of the, uh, the infrastructure for home automation and other things like that. So go check it out over at Hackaday and watch for uh, anything else I, I might write over there. Um, Check it out, like it, make positive comments, all of that good stuff. And then also you can follow me at JP underscore Bennett on Twitter and send me ideas for stuff at Hackaday and just maybe we'll uh, get something featured that you've done. And I should also say there's like 5,000 people at All Things Open. So again, I'll be running around trying to uh, sit in sessions that I believe will have uh, potential guests in them. So that's typically what I'm looking for when I'm looking at the schedule. Uh, but if you see me, yeah, uh, come up and poke me and say, hey, hey, Randall, I listen to your show or I watch your show. Uh, that'll be great. Or if you have my old Pearl books, those are fine, too. If you've seen me do a Flutter talk before, that's fine, too. All that's great. Okay, we're out of time. So, uh, Jonathan, thank you once again for your uh, lovely and talented co-host uh, capabilities. It's glad to be here. Awesome, awesome. I was just about to say, that was Jonathan Bennett. <laughs> but no, no, we don't have to do that to the co-host. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be goofy for the for the openings now. I can already tell. All right. We'll see you all again next week on Floss Weekly.